and I hope you give me a chance to try to help others. If, we, if I believe it's your decision to decide where I go, and whether I live or die, not the jury's. I believe it's your decision. I'm sorry. That, of course, was Nicholas Cruz after entering his guilty plea for 17 counts of first-degree murder and 17 counts of attempted first-degree murder for the February 14th shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School back in 2018. Now, jury selection in that case continued today. It will be up to the jury to recommend whether Cruz should face the death penalty or life in prison for his crimes. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has more on the background of this case. 911, what is your emergency? It's Valentine's Day 2018. They believe there's a shooter at the school. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School is under siege. An active shooter is terrorizing the campus. It was just a normal day at school that suddenly turned to a nightmare for the city of Parkland, Florida. The massacre marked the deadliest high school shooting in U.S. history. Surveillance video and witness identification led to the arrest of then 19 year old Nicholas Cruz. He was in my class in seventh grade and I knew he wasn't okay when he punched the window in and said, I'm going to call karma one day because he got in trouble with the teacher. Cruz was a former student at the school. He'd been expelled the year before in February 2017 for disciplinary reasons. But records indicate he was a troubled person long before the massacre. He was a huge threat to the school because of his behavior. When he was suspended, they found shells of bullets in his backpack. Just 40 days earlier, a woman who knew Cruz told the FBI he was collecting guns and ammunition and feared he was, quote, going to slip into a school and start shooting the place up. What's more, investigative reports point to years of a disturbing digital trail. Cruz reportedly researched mass shootings and posted threatening messages all over the Internet. This one says, I'm going to be a professional school shooter. In fact, it would be those very phone records as well as school surveillance video that would help authorities piece together what they say happened. A little after 2 p.m., Cruz took an Uber from his home to the school about three miles away. Security video shows a male wearing black jeans, maroon shirt, vest, and hat carrying a large black bag enter Building 12. In the first floor stairwell, he takes out an AR-15 rifle. Just then, a student walks in, sees the gun, and hurries out at 2.21 p.m. School video shows the active shooter terrorizing all three floors of the freshman building, taking the lives of 14 teenagers and three adults. Alerted by a fire alarm and what sounded like gunshots, the school resource officer, the only other person armed with a weapon on campus, makes his way towards the building but does not go in. We started hearing more and more shots, so then everyone started running. Minutes later, the shooting finally stops. The suspect drops the weapon and tactical gear, and authorities say he left campus, blending in to the crowd. Police hadn't even entered the building yet. At 3.36 p.m., more than an hour later, Cruz was stopped and arrested. Authorities interrogate Cruz and appear to secure a confession. He is charged with 17 counts of first-degree premeditated murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. During hours-long questioning, Cruz informs the detective he hears voices in his head that tell him to burn, kill, destroy. Cruz now faces the death penalty at trial. Uh, I understand fully what you're saying. Okay, are you having any trouble concentrating? No, no. Now, today there was a very important ruling by the presiding judge, the judge that the jury will be able to tour the scene of the crime at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Now, the defense argued the tour was unnecessary because videos and photos of the crime scene are available, and the defendant has already pleaded guilty. But Circuit Judge Elizabeth Schur rejected the defense's argument, writing, the court finds that a jury view of the crime scene remains useful and proper even in light of the current posture of the case. The purpose of a jury view is to assist the jury in analyzing and applying the evidence presented at trial. All right, 
Let's bring back in the think tank to break this all down. Still with me, criminal defense attorney and former federal prosecutor and Texas law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling, trial attorney Ann Bremner, and former police lieutenant and trial attorney Rick King. And I'll start with you. Um, what do you think about the judge's ruling here? She called it useful and proper. Do you think it's appropriate? Absolutely. And the jury instruction I'll get is, is that a view of the scene is not evidence. Exactly that. It's basically can be used by you to look at all of the evidence before you. It goes to their decision at sentencing, whether it's factual during the trial on, on a guilt or not, not guilty. The sentencing itself also, they've got to make factual determinations in a death penalty. Absolutely. I think she did exactly the right thing. Rick uh, King, I, I want to get you to ring in on this. I mean, my feeling is, again, I, again, I kind of agree with the defense. It's kind of what, the way I think. I thought with pictures, et cetera, that was enough for this jury. There's a lot of really terrible evidence in this case. Your thoughts on the judge's ruling? So we have to keep in mind that in this case, there was no trial. So the jury has to be given the facts of the case. Now, I, I tend to agree with you in the, in, in the sense that I think the pictures of the crime scene and the pictures of the building and that what, what they would see now in a some sort of walkthrough um, might be a little bit over. However, um, I think the prosecution's point in this is, is they want the jurors to really get a full, the full, and I hate to use the word, uh, the, the prosecution theater of what this is. Because they they want them to be there and to live it and to and to really get the full feeling of what was happening. As a defense lawyer, I think that you know we would be like, hey, I think you can look at these pictures and really get a grasp of where it was. Um, I'm not I'm not certain that it's uh, it's further in the the interest of justice by taking them there. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Now, now, Michael Sterling, uh, to further Rick's point, to give this jury the full picture, the judge has staked out over three months or three months or so for this penalty phase. Do you have any issues at all with that? I mean, there's a lot to be put in front of them, obviously. They didn't have a regular trial. There's a lot of um, uh, aggravating factors, things like uh, interfering with government functions. Crime was especially heinous. Uh, it was committed without the pretense of moral or legal justification. All those things have to be proven. But three months for the penalty phase? Yeah, I, you know, th that's a lot of time, Michael. Uh, but I understand a death penalty case does require a lot of time. It, it takes a lot of time to, to find uh, death penalty qualified jurors. So I do understand why the judge has staked out time. And I well, imagine hold on, hold on, that. Up, Michael, let me stop you there. The, the trial is going to begin May 31st. So she's given all that time between now and the trial will begin May 31st. She doesn't expect to take till May 31st, but she's given all that time. Then from the time the trial starts, May 31st, she's given until September uh, for the trial part. So it's not including jury selection. Oh, right, 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 of course. So, but I do think that because of jury selection, finding dead qualified jurors, and then the trial, you know, the thing that I'm never going to understand, Michael, is why a defense attorney takes a guilty plea in a case where there's only two options, life in prison or the death penalty. You might as well take it to trial, right, because you're going to have the death penalty phase anyway in front of the juror. I'm never going to understand uh a, a, a guilty plea in a case where you haven't already negotiated their life in prison without the possibility of parole as opposed to the death penalty. Because if those are the only two options anyways, I might as well hold you to your burden of proof and see if we can get some sort of defense. We'll clear, like for example, in a case like this, where you know guilt is, is almost clear in terms of the acts, then you go to whether or not there's the mental state uh, of the defendant who says that he heard voices in his head and whether or not there's a potential psychological defense as to whether or not he had what we call uh, the mens rea, right? Every criminal act requires mens rea, actus rea. Whether or not he had the actual mental capacity, right, to commit this crime. But to answer your question, I'm not surprised that it's going to take so you know, take that long. This is a highly publicized case. The prosecution is likely to cause somewhere 
between 75 to 100 witnesses, right? They're going to be cross-examined by the defense. This affected a lot of people. It's a public place. So when you look at the witnesses, expert witnesses, mitigating factors, aggravating factors, I'm not surprised that it's going to take that long. And I think the judge is probably trying to be prudent by letting the jurors know exactly what they're going to face in terms of how often they're going to have to come to trial during this penalty phase. Yeah, no question. I think what the, what the judge is obviously doing is she's giving this whole community a chance to heal through this penalty phase because they didn't get it on the other side because of the guilty plea. So I think we're going to see basically a trial.